worship leader Leslie and, and yeah, Kaylee raised your hand in the back for the kids. The kids let loose the children of a first Christian church. Let loose the children of war is what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, and uh, so uh, Kayla, uh, really, and Bob uh, stepped in. Our worship leader, uh, Leslie, had an uh, unfortunate encounter with a garage door that she was trying to power went out of the house, and she was trying to get the garage door down, and she thought that if she, if she just tapped it a little bit in the little crack right there that was open, that... And it smashed, and it got her fingers, and she's got one that's broken, and others are. So, she said it was, it was the most painful experience of her entire life. So. Right. Okay. So everybody else, under no circumstances, do you ever put your finger? In, are you listening? Never. <laughs> Put your finger in that, or it could, it could potentially, it could potentially get uh, smashed. And um, let's see, just uh, some people to think about. Uh, I, I might do this. I, I, Mark, you went to see Tommy Reed in the hospital. I talked to him this morning. Is that right? You did. You did. That was a nice thing to do. Tommy is. He's got really bad problems with his legs, and he's in the hospital. Now, I think he's probably going to be going to a nursing facility, probably over in the Bentonville area. So keep him in your prayers. My mother had a fall this week, uh, and, uh, and uh, she's doing better, uh, not in church today. Amy's mom had a, uh, is having some neck spasms, so she's not in church with us this morning. Anybody else want to share? Claire has pneumonia. Yeah. Um, oh, were you raising your hand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. No. What's your name? Marissa. Hi, Marissa. Uh, <laughs> my grandmother was recently diagnosed with dementia. During that time, um, a man passed away from dementia. And then she was in What's her name? Um, Sherry Okay. Well, let's, let's say a prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're praying for Sherry and her situation. And, and glad that she was able to survive that. And um, uh, also the person that, that took advantage of her is obviously in a very, very bad place as well. We're thinking of people that have got a lot of pains and aches and pneumonias and, and injured fingers and sore necks and, and bruises and bumps. And uh, it's a lot of hardship in this world. And so we're just lifting up all those to you in prayer. And we make these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. Deb Clark's beauty was preserved. Deb Clark's beauty was preserved. Yes. Oh, well, Deb, your all, beauty, all so you're, you're still, all your beauty pageant plans are still in, oh, in effect? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, wonderful. You're all welcome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Dee. Uh, let me just start off with this. I'm kind of a selfish person. I'm glad that somebody made a noise. <gasps> well, I am, you know, I find out, I find that a lot of times I'm thinking about myself. You know, I'm not... I'm not necessarily trying to think about myself, but the self is a very persistent thing to have, you know, because it has aches, it has, it has pains. Sometimes things don't go the way I want them to go. 
that I feel sorry for myself. Sometimes things are sometimes things are hard. And I found out that if you really want to feel sorry for yourself, you should become a preacher. Okay. Yeah, because churches, they just don't, they just won't do right. <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's just hard. And, and so anyway, you can start to, and then if you're a preacher, you can start to think, if we just make the budget. You know, I used to not I used to not worry about money in church, then I became a preacher. Uh, but I remember years ago, I used to just go to church. And I just went there, and I listened to the music, and I, I heard a message, and it was also inspiring and everything. And I didn't know the stuff that was going on, you know, like in the background. But what can happen is when you get to work in it on things, you can start to feel something called scarcity, like you don't have enough, like you're just trying to make it. Like you feel like if you just if you just make the budget, if you just if you just keep the lights on and keep everything going that you've done enough. And, and, and life can kind of feel that way too. Just if you end up, just if you can take care of yourself and pay your bills and just make it with all the different challenges that you have, you can think that you've done enough. And there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into all of that. But there's this Jesus person. And the Jesus person comes along. And he, and, and he kind of messes with things. And he says that, you know, when you, just when you've got your stuff taken care of, there's other people out there. Good morning, Rachel and Andrea. Nice to see you all this morning. Um, and uh, that when you've got everything, you know, sort of, even if you could get everybody taken care of in your church, there's a world out there to think of. And Jesus is always pushing, pushing us out beyond whatever our whatever our boundaries are to to think to think broader, to think to think more deeply. And uh, so, in a way, Jesus never lets us go about that. He's always he's always out there in front of us. Uh, and if you really let him get hold of you, Jesus will make you think of the whole world. Uh, and so uh, there's a there's a text this morning I like to look at Luke 4 16, 16 to 30 and it was a it was a time when Jesus he went back to his hometown to give a sermon and it went over so well that the congregation decided that, that it would be good to kill him <laughs> that's uh, that's hard. <laughs> Uh, to go back to your hometown and preach a sermon and have the reaction. I mean, literally, the reaction of the people that heard this sermon was to take Jesus to the edge of town and sort of throw him off this cliff to kill him. That was the reaction they had to the sermon. What could Jesus have said that was so radically offensive to these people that they thought they needed to kill him? Well, let's find out. Okay, so here we are. Verses 16, we'll start out with verses 16 to 21. He went to Nazareth, Jesus, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight, recovery of sight to the for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So that was the scripture passage he read, and then he announced, Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Now imagine you're in the crowd, and... You're uh, a Jewish person of that of that era. If you were going to feel sorry for yourself, what might you feel sorry about? Anyone? What might you feel sorry about if you're a Jewish person of that day and time that Jesus was preaching to? Being oppressed by the Romans. Being oppressed by the Romans. Imagine if our country was taken over by another country and we had 
not only pay our taxes, but pay taxes to them as well. If we didn't pay the taxes, uh, they had soldiers that were uh, more than happy to kill us or take all of our stuff, and that the tax collectors that we had to pay our taxes to were our former friends and neighbors who had started working for these folks, and we noticed that they had new cars. You imagine you might have something to feel a little grumpy about. And that when the text is read that the oppressed are going to be set free, who might you think is the oppressed? Us. And so here is this text from Isaiah that they would have all been very familiar with. It's a very famous text. Here Jesus reads it and he says, and today I, I proclaim that this is fulfilled within your hearing. Well, let's see how the people responded to it. Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they ask. Now, would this be a good time to stop the sermon? Uh, yes! Who's loving it? Everybody. And they're saying, isn't this, isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. Everybody's loving it, and you're the hero. And so what should you do now? Stop. Yes, Mark. I know you want to say something. But like the people from three He has to go. He has to keep going on. And ruin everything. Okay. So now this is where, so it's funny because you know, like Star Trek, everything's great, and then it just goes downhill and just like like a like a roller coaster, like a like a realtor on a <laughs> like a realtor on ice. It's just worse. <laughs> okay. So this is the first thing that kind of makes them realize that things are maybe heading in a different direction. So everybody's all happy with him. He says, "Surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown." What we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Now remember, he before he gets there, he has, he's had this, he's done a lot of amazing healings and things. So, so that's what they're probably, they know, we, we've heard that he's been doing healings in these other places. Maybe he's going to do these healings here. And he says, I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Okay. Then he says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So, he's saying, to tell you the truth, uh, no prophet except in his hometown. And, example, you know, like you do, like in sermons, you give examples. Example number one, there was a time in, uh, in Israel when there was a drought happening. And, what did God do? God sent Elijah, not to any of them, but to this woman in Zarephath, in Sidon, in the so to a foreigner. So I tell you what, there was a time when Israel was having a drought, but God sent anybody to help me? Oh, no, sent a prophet to help, help the uh, foreigner. And then he said, and then there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was clean, cleansed, only named in the Syria. So you remember that time? Remember a lot of people had leprosy, but who did? Who got cleansed? The the foreigner, uh, the outsider. Okay, so do you remember? <laughs> this is kind of funny. Verse twenty two says, "All spoke well of him." Verse twenty eight says, "People in the synagogue were furious." <laughs> to from twenty two to twenty eight, six verses later, he goes from everybody loving it to everybody hating it. <laughs> All the people, this is everybody, that's interesting, but everybody loved it and everybody hated it. Then it gets worse. It says, verse 20, they got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built. And remember, this is his hometown. In order to throw him down the cliff. Verse 30 says, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now that's an interesting turnaround moment. He doesn't, he doesn't yell at anybody. 
He doesn't strike out at anybody. It's like he lets him push him all the way to the edge there, get ready to throw him on. Then it says he just, he turns around and he walks right through the crowd and goes on his way. So there's, uh, there's one thing about this that's very obvious and there's one thing that's kind of hidden. Uh, the obvious thing is that Jesus is obviously pointing people beyond their group. And people don't like that. Okay? Because we live in an us versus them world. And Jesus does not live in an us versus them world. Jesus lives in an us world. And it's all us. And he does not recognize the enemy. He doesn't recognize somebody that's not one of us, not somebody that's a child of God, not somebody that should be prayed for and loved. And this can be, this can be very uh, traumatic. Uh, I have seen, it's very, you can see signs that will say, pray for our troops. And I think that's a very appropriate thing to do. How many times do you see a sign that says, pray for their troops? Pray for all the troops. Because all the people that get into the military are in their own country trying to do the best they can do with regard to their, they're just people. They're all just people. And that's how Jesus saw the world. They're all, they're all people. There is nobody that's not one of us. There is no them. Uh, there is, there is no, there are no good guys. There are no bad guys. You know, to the people that thought they were good, you think you're good? To the people at that time that thought, now I'm good, I mean, I am good, I am going by all the laws, I'm doing all the stuff, I'm even doing all the traditions, I'm doing all that stuff. You know what Jesus said to them? Not as good as you think you are. Do you love your enemies? Do you do good to the people who oppress you? He, he went on the Sermon on the Mount, and he pointed out the hypocrisy of the people that thought they were good. And then the people that thought they were bad, that knew they were bad, and thought that there was no hope for them, he said, you're more worthy than you can imagine. So he brought everybody, he brought everybody together. So that's what he's doing in this sermon. He's saying God is for everyone, for all of us. So that's, you can see that. There's something that's really interesting though that you might not be able, that you might not be able to see. So, does somebody, would somebody be willing to read Isaiah 61 2? Isaiah 61 2. Anybody? Anybody? I see some people are turning to it. Isaiah 61 2. Now, Jesus, at the very end, he's quoting from Isaiah. And what Jesus ends, he ends by saying that, that he's going to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from the darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the God, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stops right there. You know, when you read the Bible, you can start somewhere and you stop somewhere, and where you where you start and where you stop kind of means something. So, somebody read Isaiah sixty one two. You have it, Andrea. Okay, so Isaiah. That, That, it has that, right, the thing, that, the, the line that comes right after to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in Isaiah, the very next sentence is, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, this is exactly what Jesus gets in trouble for, because, like John the Baptist, people were wondering, are you the one who is to come? Because he was going around talking about the Lord's favor for everybody, loving everybody, healing everybody, pronouncing forgiveness on people doing all of these things, and some of the people in Israel were asking, but when is the, you remember that commercial, where's the beef? It's like, where's the vengeance? Where's the vengeance, Jesus? When are you going to do the vengeance part? We're going to do the vengeance on the Romans. We're going to do the vengeance on the sinners. And they, matter of fact, they criticized him. They said he was a friend of sinners. And that was probably one of the main reasons that he, he was killed. Uh, 
the expositor's Bible commentary says uh, the admission of that phrase, the day of the vengeance from our God, is significant. Jesus' audience would suppose that the day of their own salvation would be the day of judgment on their pagan enemies. But the, day, but the delay of judgment means that this time of the Lord's favor benefits the Gentiles also. Jesus affirms that Gentiles are also recipients of God's grace, even when the Jews were not so blessed. So even when the Jews are having a hard time, God's still in the business of blessing the Gentiles. Uh, N.T. Wright says, uh, the people of Jesus' day were astonished that Jesus was speaking about God's grace. Grace for everybody, including the nations, instead of grace for Israel and fierce judgment for everyone else. Why then did Jesus begin his address with a long quotation from Isaiah? Though his text goes on to speak of vengeance on evildoers, Jesus doesn't quote that. Instead, he seems to have drawn on the larger picture in Isaiah and elsewhere, which speaks of Israel being called to be the light of the nations. The servant Messiah has not come to inflict punishment on the nations, but to bring God's love and mercy to them. And that will be the fulfillment of a central theme in Israel's own scriptures. This message was and remains shocking. Jesus claimed to be reaching out and healing to all people. Though itself a vital Jewish idea was not what most first century Jews wanted or expected. As we shall see, Jesus coupled it with severe warnings to his own countrymen. So Jesus tended to, instead of comforting his own countrymen, tended to warn them. Unless they could see that this was the time for their God to be gracious, unless they abandoned their futile dreams of a military victory over their national enemies, they would suffer defeat themselves at every level, military, political, and theological. Here, as at the climax of the gospel story, Jesus' challenge and warning brings about a violent reaction. The gospel still does this today, when it challenges all interests and agendas with the news of God's surprising grace. So, we want to follow Jesus, right? Jesus then leads us to love and to serve everyone. He recognizes no boundaries, and if you follow him, he will call you beyond yourself. It's, just not, it's not just about taking care of yourself. It's not just about taking care of your family. It's not just about taking care of your friends. It's about taking care of everyone. Doesn't that seem a little overwhelming? I mean, everyone, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. So, um, but we think at this church that this is more and more increasingly, this is our path in the future. That if we want to grow as a church, that we need to grow in our compassion that we have for the most vulnerable people among us. And so we're working to get better and better at that. We had meetings this last weekend with a group called Hope Partnership. Did anybody hear about those meetings? Maybe heard about it, we've been talking about it a lot. But what we're trying to do is get better at being uh, servants in the world of all who are suffering. And one of the things that we learned this weekend is that, and we've been thinking about this, is that we do not want to be in the business of counting hot dogs. Now let me explain what this means. There was this church, and they wanted to help people, and so they started helping children that were hungry and they did an after-school program, and they were feeding the hungry children, and they were feeding them hot dogs, and what they did was they fed them a hot dog, and what they, you know what they kept track of? How many hot dogs? Now, you can do worse things than feeding hungry children hot dogs, but in the midst of feeding the hungry children hot dogs, what they didn't do was actually talk to any of the children or find out anything about them or their lives. They just said, here's your hot dog. That's called ministering to people, not ministering with people. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so when we go, we're going to do uh, House of Hope on Tuesday night. And we're going to feed them to the folks who soup. And we're going to say, here's your soup. Then those of us in the church are going to go get in the corner. And we're going to sit in a circle. And we're just going to talk to ourselves. And if we see that they're breaking any of the rules, we're going to say, hey, stop that. 
and that's going to be our ministry. Isn't that beautiful? No. <laughs> that's not what we're going to do? Well, yeah. Well, I will say, some of the people, some of those folks at the House of Hope are beer bags. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> but it turns out there's this little question you can ask somebody, which is something like, oh, so tell me about your life. And sometimes if you ask somebody that, they'll, you know, they'll tell you about, uh, about your life. And for some of these folks that are maybe living in cars or homeless or whatever, nobody really wants to find out about them. Nobody really wants to know about their, about their life. And just, the, just that you see them and that you ask them about, about their life, it does something for them. And then you know who else it does something for? You. Remember I told you that I was selfish? Well, when I'm talking to somebody and they're saying, yeah, I'm living in my car and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I, just hope, I just hope that I can you know, make it through the night. For a little moment there, guess who I forget about? Me. And I start to feel thankful for things that I might not normally feel thankful for. But don't worry. Pretty soon I go back to my regular old self and feel sorry for myself. But then, so that's why it's good. I need regular, that's why I need to come to church, that's why I need to have community, that's why I need to be in fellowship, that's why. And I would not be nearly as good a person if it wasn't for church, because most of the things that church has me do are things I really don't want to do. <laughs> Gonna go to House of Hope. Really, I'd rather stay home. But it's the church, so I've got to go. And then I end up, and you know, this wonderful thing happens. You know, again, I have this experience, you know, that I wouldn't have done on my own. So church kind of drags me along, makes me a better person than I would normally be. And that's grace, and that's mercy, and that's love, and that's forgiveness. That's right. Heavenly Father, uh, you sent Jesus into the world, and man, did he make people angry. Uh, but also did he uh, include everybody and make us all feel love and leave an impression that we're still trying to understand today. Uh, help our church as we continue to try to follow Jesus. As we stumble along after his perfect example, we're thankful for his grace and mercy. He convicts us of our self-righteousness, but he also makes us feel loved and valued even in the, even in the midst of our failures. And so we're just so thankful uh, for him and help us as we continue to grow as a church. We make these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So it's kind of an exciting time to be a part of First Christian Church. We're, uh, we're, we're trying to cast this vision for the church for the next five years of how we're going to grow and our ability to be caring and compassionate in our community. We're even going to write something called a future story. We're going to write a story about what we're going to be like in five years. Have you ever done that for yourself personally? I have. It's kind of scary. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine writing some your future story to yourself five years from now? Did you do that? <laughs> But it's hard, and it's hard to think about, you know, it's hard to think about who we're going to be in the future. So we're, 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 if we can't, I remember, uh, who's excited about baseball season? <laughs> Not too many people. Who's excited about the Texas Rangers? Hey, great! Glad you're here. Okay, so, so the Texas Rangers, you know, they're not, they've never won, they've never won the World Series, and uh, they got close a couple times, but they had, then they had a terrible season. And the, the, I was listening to an interview, and the coach came in, and he was talking to the team. After they had a terrible season, he said the first thing he talked to them about was about winning the World Series. And I was like, why would you talk to a team that didn't even play 500 baseball last year about winning the World Series? And he said, well, you're not going to ever do something that at least you can't imagine. So you've got to at least imagine it, be able to think about it, kind of imagine it. So we're going to imagine this amazing future for Five years from now, this place is going to be just totally transformed. And we're going to be serving the community in ways that's going to blow everybody's mind. And people all over here are going to say, oh my gosh, what's happening in First Christian Church? All these, we're going to write this amazing future story. We may not live up to it. 
but at least we're going to envision, at least we're going to imagine it, and then we're going to see, and then we're going to see what happens along the way. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So we're going to be crazy visionary, and we're going to think about all the all the things that might um, possibly happen around here. Uh, and being a member of this church, for those who are visiting today, well, first of all, communion is open. To anybody who wants to be a member of the church to have communion, we want to include everybody. And being a member of the church is an incredibly complicated process. Most people fail. No. Well, just, Yeah, I'm going to 